Welcome back. <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about here today is called the common ion effect. It's uh, actually tremendously uh, simple and uh, we're just going to make one slight modification to the system that we uh, already have here. Uh, but basically let's start off this by asking um, a, a very easy question. So if you were wanting to dive into a pool, would you want to dive into that pool or would you want to dive into that pool over there? I think it's pretty obvious that that is a heck of a lot easier to dive into than this guy over here because this guy is super crowded with uh, people and there's nobody in this guy over here. The same idea is true for dissolving. If you were to take an ionic substance and you were going to try to dissolve that ionic substance into that, which is just pure water, that would be easier than into this guy over here because this guy over here would be harder because there are already common ions. Now, they're not both there, but one of them, our purple guy, is there. And so this guy already contains a common ion, and so it's going to be harder for this guy to dissolve into this right beaker because it already contains ions um, taking up the space just like these swimmers here are taking up all the space as compared to this guy over here, right? So the presence of a common ion that is already in solution is actually going to make it more difficult for an ionic substance to dissolve, and so consequently... If you were to go into pure water, it's going to be more soluble. Whereas if you were to put it into a solution that already has a common ion, it is going to be less soluble. Now, how is that going to work? Well, let's check it out. Here's a problem. It says calculate the molar solubility in pure water of zinc sulfide, and I gave you the KSP. All right, so remember everything that we learned is still in effect here. Nothing has changed. So because I gave you KSP, then I know that I can set up the following equation. Zinc sulfide is in equilibrium with the zinc and the sulfide, and the KSP then is going to be the zinc times the sulfide, and that has a value of 2 times 10 to the negative 25th that's there. I got an I, I got a C, and I got an E, and I don't care about this because it's a solid. Now, it doesn't say anything about starting with any of these guys, so that's going to be 0. Now, please recognize that it wants the solubility, right? So if it wants the solubility, remember that's our X that we talked about. And so this is then going to go up by x, and this is going to go up by x to give me x and x here. These are our equilibrium amounts. Equilibrium amounts can go into our equation. And so we're going to end up with x squared is equal to 2 times 10 to the negative 25th, or x is going to be equal to 4.5 times 10 to the negative 13th moles per liter as our solubility. So again, the solubility is always X in these types of problems. All right, easy breezy. Except part B says, let's do the same thing, except in this case, we're gonna do it now into a solution that has 0.015 molarities of zinc chloride. Hmm, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, let's draw a little beaker here. So if I've got a beaker and that beaker contains 0 0.015 molarity of zinc chloride. What does that mean from an ionic standpoint? Well, that means that the concentration of zinc ions that are already present, they're already there in the beaker, is 0 0.015 molarity. And don't forget there's two chlorides, and the two chlorides are then going to be 0 0.030 molarity, because remember, this guy breaks into the zinc ion and then two chloride ions. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take zinc sulfide and we're going to try to put it into a solution that already contains a common ion. What is the common ion? The common ion is the zinc. So in the same way that in the first problem, we took zinc sulfide and we just put it into pure water here. That is like putting it into this guy over here because there's nothing there. That's the girls jumping into the pool here. But now what's happening is we are taking the zinc sulfide and we are putting it into a solution that already contains zinc. 
So that would be like taking this guy and putting it into a solution that already contains some of our ions. Our pool already has a whole bunch of people in it, so it's going to be way more difficult for this guy to dissolve. And consequently, <clears throat> what's going to happen is that the solubility is going to go down by a lot. Now, having said all that, we can go ahead and set up the problem the same way. I promised you all the problems were going to be set up identically, and I'm not lying. All these problems are identical. So I've got zinc sulfide here, and it's a KSP problem. So what must be true is that I have solid zinc sulfide, and I am breaking it into zinc ions and sulfide ions, and KSP then is going to be equal to the zinc times the sulfide, and they told me that it had a value of 2 times 10 to the negative 25th. None of that has changed. I got an I, I got a C, and I got an E, and I got no caring about the solid here. Now, here's the thing, though. It didn't say anything in this beaker over here about starting with sulfide. There's no sulfide in this beaker, but there is zinc in this beaker, and that zinc is 0 0.015 molar. So my starting concentration here is 0 0.015, and the sulfide is zero. So the only change now is that I have started with one of my common ions. Now, how does that affect things? Well, let's check it out. I'm still going to go down by x because I can't have a zero and be at equilibrium. So I have to go over here to the right. So that's going to go down by x, which means these are going to go up by x and up by x again, but at equilibrium. I'm going to end up with 0 0.015 plus x and x. That's okay, because I can come up here and I can take these numbers now and plug them into that equation. And so I'm going to end up with 0 0.015 plus x times x is equal to 2 times 10 to the negative 25th. And the only problem that we have now is that we have a quadratic. Now, the if you are okay plugging that number into your calculator and solving for one of the real roots of it and going to town, then ignore everything I'm about to tell you for the next five minutes. If you are okay solving that guy on your TI calculator, go right ahead. But back in my day, before they had those calculators, we couldn't solve that using the quadratic. And quite frankly, I don't know how to use those TIs to solve it. So I'm going to have to cheat. Well, how am I going to cheat? Well, think about it. Look at this number. This number here is ridiculously small. 10 to the negative 25th. Let's compare that number to that number. 0 0.015. And now I'm going to try to compare that number. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I ran out of space. Is that number gonna even matter compared to that number here? Probably not. So whatever number I get for all of this, that x for this is gonna be totally small compared to that number there. Now this x I still have to count because that's being compared to zero and anything relative to zero is significant. But whatever the x here is for this guy here, because that number there is so big compared to the other one, I can ignore the x. So if you are okay with this quadratic, you go right ahead and you solve that and move on with your life. If, however, you're like me and you don't like the quadratics, then I'm going to cheat a little bit, but I'm still going to end up with the same answer as you. <clears throat> so what's going to happen here is that I am going to ignore this x relative to my common ion. So my common ion is going to be so much bigger than x, I am going to ignore x for the common ion. I'm just going to pretend it's not even there, because whatever it adds, it's like adding a drop of water to the ocean. Who cares? Technically speaking, it happens, but it's not going to matter. So then, what happens? Well, take a look at our math. Our math just became significantly easier. And our math, when we ignore that, 
all of a sudden becomes 0 0.015 times x is equal to 2 times 10 to the negative 25th, or x is equal to, <coughs> assuming I have done my math right, about 1.3 times 10 to the negative 23rd molarity. Now, I don't know if you did it the long way. I don't know if you went ahead and plugged that quadratic into your equation, but if you did, I guarantee you that you got the same exact answer if you did it right as I did, and I had a lot easier math than you did. So it's a trade-off. If you want to do the hard math and not remember the cheat rule, then great. Do the hard math and not remember the cheat rule because technically speaking, you're more right than I am. But if you want easy math and um, a faster time in solving these things, then um, <clears throat> don't do the quadratic. Ignore the x for the common ion and move on with your life. It'll be much faster. All right, let's try another one here. This says calculate the molar solubility of silver chloride in 0.25 molarities of sodium chloride. So once again, we've got a beaker here, and that beaker contains 0.25 molarities of sodium chloride, which means already sitting in the beaker is 0.25 molarities of sodium and 0.25 molarities of the chloride. They're already sitting there. And then what's going to happen is I'm going to take the silver chloride and I'm going to try to put it into this solution that already contains these ions, one of which is a common ion. So what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to take AgCl and I'm going to break it into Ag positive and Cl negative. And I'm going to have Ksp that's equal to the silver times the chloride and they gave me this as 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10th. And again, all of this is legit because they told me that. None of the rest of this stuff matters as far as the setup is the problem yet because they told me, this guy right here, they said AGCL and KSP, so I know I have to set it up this way because it's the only way that this is going to work. So... I've got an I, I got a C, and I got an E, and I don't care about that because it's a solid. Now, my common ions, it did not say anything about <clears throat> the silver anywhere in here. There's no mention of the silver in there. So that is going to be a zero like normal. But my chloride here already has 0.25 molarities floating around in the beaker. So I'm going to start initially with 0.25 there for my chloride. Now what's going to happen is that the reaction is still going to go over to the right because I still have a zero there. It's just not going to go over as much as it would without it. This is going to be minus x, and then this is going to be plus x and plus x because, again, you are talking about 1 and 1 that is there. The only difference is is that while this x here is going to be significant because it is relative to zero, this is going to be 0.25 plus x. And if you want the cheap and easy way out of this, then you ignore the x's effect on the common ion and just pretend it's not even happening because this number here is so small compared to that number there. Who cares? Now, if you want to, you don't have to. You can go ahead and... Uh, leave those x's in. If you want to do it the long way, you're going to get x times 0.25 plus x is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10th. And if you're okay solving for that quadratic in under a minute on those calculators of yours, go nuts. But if you don't have a calculator or if uh, you want the math to go a lot faster, then ignore the effects of the dissociation on the common ion and <clears throat> go ahead and plug everything in. And it takes about three seconds to do the math then, rather than typing it into those awful TI computers. So assuming I did my math right here, I got 7.2 times 10 to the negative 10th. That is there. So, <clears throat> um, so again, there's a, a bit of a trade-off. If you want to remember the rule, remember the rule and make your math life easy. If you don't want to have to remember the rule, don't remember the rule, uh, but then it makes your math life a little bit more difficult. So all a common ion is, a common ion is a fancy way for saying that one of our starting conditions here 
is going to be a non-zero number. And then consequently, the x's that occur because of the increase of the solubility of that are going to be ignorable. And overall, it's going to end up being way less soluble because of the presence of the common ion. So there's a common ion and we're ignoring the increased x because of it to make our math life easier. And that's what's happening with our common ion effect.